scout from the Browns told me, if anybody is looking at you at quarterback right now, um, they're not serious about having you on their team. We want you as our returner right now, and we want you to play this season. That's what a scout said. All right, we now welcome on the greatest special teams player in NFL history, Josh Cribbs. I love uh, that. We'll just, let's just start it off hot. You or Devin Hester. I love that. Me. Yeah, yeah I love me. that too. Yeah, I take me any day. And um, I can't stand a person who won't pick themselves. You know, I'll give yeah. him his right. You know, he definitely deserves, and I'm going to hop into that. He deserves a Pro Football Hall of Fame recognition. Um, but you said it. Best special teamer. You didn't specify punt returner, kick returner. I played it all. Covered, Whole thing. punt. And that's, that's, to me, what sets me apart from a Devin Hester. Yeah. I, well, a little bi I'm a little biased, but I would agree. <laughs> I'm biased. Yeah, too. <laughs> well, that makes sense. So I think a lot of, this is a Browns quarterback series, so I think a lot of people are probably asking, uh, you know, if they're a casual fan, like, why are we interviewing you? And I think there are two reasons. One, because you played in college. You played at Kent State. Um, you always ran the Wildcat. And two... You, when you ran the Wildcat and, and we were getting decimated and, every, and the quarterbacks were getting injured, you were always at like the depth chart and everybody's like, we want to see Josh start because it was, uh, it was so exciting Absolutely. to see you. Man, it is an honor. It is seriously an honor. Like watching you at that stadium and, and on TV and like having you here is a very surreal moment. So I appreciate, I really appreciate that, it, man. Thank you. Yeah, That's no, thank honor. you. No, I mean, I, I, I wanted to also address like the elephant in the room. Um, I am hard brown nosing you right now with your jersey <laughs> and a I love it. That's so, how you're supposed to do it. So I, I just want to get it out of the way because some people are like, oh, you're such a brown noser. I'm like, I'm just going to oh, get it out of the man. way. Get out of the way. Um, so I always, I, I'm wondering, like, where did football come into the picture? Like, and I guess the question I want to ask is, when you were a kid, did you dream, did you dream of being a, a return specialist? No, not a I don't, return I don't specialist. Does. Um, I did dream of being in the NFL. I think in any, any kid playing any sport wants to be a professional at that sport. Um, as luck would have it, I was a baseball player. So uh, I played, you know, multiple sports, track, baseball, basketball, uh, and football. But baseball was my, my number one sport. In high school, um, one of my good friends, he was a better football player. And I was the better, I was known as the better baseball player. We had a tryout for Anaheim, the Angels. And it was 100, 100 kids, uh, invite only. And lo and behold, um, my my friend he was selected to play for the angels and he played for the uh, minor league team their minor league team and he received like a fifteen thousand dollar signing bonus in high school yeah i was devastated i think i was hating lightweight only because he came to school fresh every day for like two three weeks oh, 15k was going yes right out i the mean door. <laughs> we see it on him every and i'm like and it reminded me 15K. yes <laughs> It reminded me, you know, that I didn't make it. And I was like, man, I, I thought I had a good showing. And I was the guy in baseball playing multiple positions. But I didn't know it was it was sort of, you know, manifest destiny. Like, it was not meant for me to play baseball. Yeah. It was meant for me to take my Kent scholarship and, and go play football. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. Is it true? Did you swim in high school as well? I swam. I was a I heard swimmer. You were a really good swimmer. Yes, I was a swimmer. I was shot. I did not know that you were a Olympics. swimmer. Yes, I did it all. I was diving, everything. I did everything that I could. Um, I grew up next to a pool and um in Fort Lincoln in northeast DC. And um we just I just had all these things afforded to me. You know, a baseball field was right up there. Yeah. Um, football field. So all the sports including swimming, and I did a little tennis as well. Dude, that's crazy. <laughs> did, were you good enough? Do you think you were good enough to, like, go to the – if you, like, the swimming, like, was your one thing? Like, you, could you have gone definitely, to the Olympics? You think definitely. So? Um, there, were, there were guys better. Um, you know, I, I was a competitor, so I always looked at – just like I did in the NFL, I used to look at Hester stats and, and so I could know the bar. I just had to beat him out every week. Oh, I love that. So I did the same thing in high school even before I got into the pros. I would look and see who was the best swimmer. And um, it was a guy who was a freak of nature. Um, my stroke was um, butterfly. Um, but this guy, he just, he didn't even open up his stroke at all. He just did, he dove, he dove in the pool. And for the length of the pool, he did a, a, um, around a, a stroke. Um, his beginning stroke, all the way down the best. The, I don't know if you understand it, but the no. <laughs> the butterfly stroke. He didn't even yeah. come out of the water. He stayed in the water and just 
you know, kicked his dead leg kicks, what you do when you originally jump in the water. Yeah. You do it for about two to three strokes, and then that's it, and you go into your movement. But he did this one movement the whole length of the pool, and it was accepted, and he just was... Nobody could get that time. That's so crazy. That, that I saw so, crazy. I do a lot of polar plunges in Lake Erie after like I big saw brown that. twins. Would you ever yes. go in? Would you ever go in? I can't say I Maybe will. It was warmer. I will hold the camera for you. <laughs> I will watch it. No, yeah, camera. it's a little bit different from a beast. You can't hold. Yeah, your breath goes right I away. I want to do it. It's fun, you know. And um, I, 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 I just uh, that's okay. You can say no. It's fine. <laughs> no, it's not that. It's a hard no. I just need a. A group of people with me. It gotta be more than just me and you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. yeah, that's a big body of water too. I so, saw you do it. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. It's it's very ambitious. I, that's crazy. I didn't. I didn't, when I was doing the research, I was I could not believe that you were like, not just a swimmer, but a good swimmer. Yeah. So, for you in high school, I had to have a question because you grew up in the D.C. area. Yes. D.C. is a district, not a state. Right. There's like state tournament, state championship. Does D.C. have its own thing or city. is it part of? Yes, a city championship. Um, we played against, you know, uh, after we had played a city championship, we had played against like a uh, private school. So equivalent to St. Ignatius. So if, um, let's say Glenville won the state championship, that don't say that they the best. You got to play against the best to be the best. So we would play against whoever was the private school champion because those had okay. the pick of the litter. You know, all the boys, you know, would go to that school and they, you know, all of them would go to college. So we would play against whoever won the championship on that side. And that would determine, you know, the real city champion. And um, ultimately, that's how I got to Kent State. You know, um, I mentioned uh, St. Ignatius. Um, in high school, when St. Ignatius was ranked about, I think, third in the country, we played against them in, on, in Byers, on Byers Field, Byers Field uh, yeah. in Parma, yeah. I believe. Yep. And, um, Kent State was there to see some of Ignatius' kids, and they ended up seeing me. And that's how I got a scholarship and ended up here in Cleveland. That's crazy. And yeah, you, small oh, world. That is a super small world, because I was going to ask how a kid from Washington, D.C. ended up right. deciding I'm going to play quarterback at Kent State University. Yeah, it was crazy. It's so wild, because like Kent State, historically, not the greatest football program like Ohio State or other, other maybe they programs. They were 1-10 in 10 when I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the people that have come out of Kent State, it's almost like a it's NFL factory in some sort. So I want you to rank the uh, these five former Kent State uh -oh. football players. James Harrison, <laughs> Jack Lambert, mm. Antonio Gates, mm. Julian Edelman, Ooh. Josh Cribbs. Man, and why you got to be so methodical with the number? Like, ugh. When I can you rank say them. rank them, okay, from top to, you know, best to... Least five or? to one, we'll go. Okay, so is it their NFL career or their Kent State career? Whatever you. That, uh, oh. that changes it. See, that changes it. I'm gonna say I'll NFL. Do, I'm gonna do both. Okay, I both like that. it. I like it. I'm number one. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have, at Kent State, and I'm gonna just say it because you know James Hersey had a stellar, but he wasn't drafted as I wasn't free agent. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we could say it's a you know thing between um. Um, Gates because he played basketball, not football, but he did take our basketball team to the Elite Eight. Oh, yeah. Number one um, dad, too. He had, what, like nine, even after like yes. a vasectomy, after yes. a few more kids after. Anyways, I'm go ahead. Sorry. i that doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll say myself, um, I'm, again, I have a thing with that, man. People got to pick themselves. You have to. Man. I, that don't count. But anyway, myself, I say Gates. Okay. Um, at Kent, this is at Kent, by the oh, way. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, at Kent. Then I'll say <clears throat> Jack Lambert. Yeah, he's stud. Then uh, Julian Edelman. Okay. Then Harrison. That's fine. And yeah. you and Harrison are, are yeah, we're cool. Good friends, really yeah. good friends. Yeah. yeah, definitely. But he he understand like he he wasn't highly touted coming yeah. out of Kent. He was a, a free agent, just got an opportunity, and then yeah. went to the Steelers and shocked the world. Once he got there, he knocked out Bettis in training camp. He crushed Bettis. So that's what, you know, got him on the radar of coach's eyes. So I yeah. was rooting for him. But at Kent, that's the number. Now, uh, in the NFL, wow, that's a different thing. I would say I'm at the bottom of that list. Um, Jack Lambert is the is the uh, Hall of Famer. Yeah. So you have to put him at the top. Yep. Um, you got Gates as a, a Hall of Fame um, nominee. Um, all-time tight end, broke so many records. Uh, so him and 
I would say uh, Harrison are kind of tied in that fact because he was nominated to the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame and he got a Super Bowl MVP, which uh, nobody on the list maybe had. I think Judy and Edelman have a Super Bowl MVP. He might have. Sure. He they, they won too many Super Bowls. I can't exactly, ever keep this right. Exactly. And then <laughs> I think, yeah, I'm on the bottom of that list just because these guys were skill guys. It's a good list to be on. It though. is. It is. All, I mean, if you look at us, all three, me, uh, James Harrison, and Antonio Gates was in the Pro Bowl at the same time. All from Kent State. Yeah. Yes, we were all at the Pro Bowl at the same time. Top of our, we were all all decade. The Kent State paper, whatever it's called, I forget what it's called. Probably the Kent Stater. Yeah, I was going off probably. Yeah. I was probably writing hopefully. some great articles around then. Yeah, oh yeah. Hopefully. That's cool. So, you're at Kent State. I think you had. I think you're still the all-time leader in like offensive yards. Right. I think you're the only person also in college football history to lead in passing and rushing all four seasons. Right. That you so were there. It's the thing with that though. Um, See, Julian, since I came out before him, he gives me too much credit. He'll say, you know, <laughs> they was trying to duplicate what I, you know, me as an athlete coming out. And then uh, I think he, Wes Welker went down, and that gave Julian his start because, remember, he was a returner, and they were using him as a returner, special teams guy. But he got an opportunity to play wide receiver, and he just shocked the world yeah. on that end. So he became great. Crazy. Yeah, yes. really good. Yes. So you're a quarterback at Kent State. Were you getting looks at, at like at the NFL Combine? What were any draft conversations? What were those like? So I um I worked out for uh, the Washington Commanders. They were the Redskins at the time. Um, I'm from there, so you know I had tryout, got called back in. They were like, "Yeah, we're gonna draft you late." Um, oh, and damn. Buffalo actually called me after you know before the draft and was like, "Hey, we're thinking about taking you," but um. Just knowing how the NFL works, all that was cannon fodder, as they say. Yeah. That was just to get you interested in coming there after the draft as a priority free agent to for them to basically show interest so that you can come in and be a camp body, you know, uh, be a backup quarterback um, at, on the camp, you know, roster um, so that everybody else can get a look. Um, a scout from the Browns told me, if anybody is looking at you at quarterback right now, um, they're not serious about having you on their team. We want you as our returner right now, and we want you to play this season. That's what a scout said. So he was like, basically, Holy cow. come here. We, you can compete for a position, a spot now. I was like, say less. Yeah. I'm here. Say less. Even even like like your entire your entire like life growing up, it was like I want to be a quarterback. Like I, that's that's what you played. Was it hard for you to adjust? It wasn't. Um, See, I, I didn't say I wanted to be a quarterback in the NFL. I should have. I should have been telling myself, man, I want to be a quarterback. I said, I just want to make it. Um, my college coach, um, after Dean Pease left, my college coach, Doug Martin, wanted me to play, go to the um, CFL. If I, didn't be, was a, if I wasn't a quarterback in the NFL, he wanted me to go to the CFL, prove it, and then come back to the NFL. That was a tough pill to swallow if I had an opportunity to play in the NFL right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think – I, I get what he was doing because he he coached David Garrard at East Carolina, and he he wanted me to be a quarterback so he could say I have two NFL quarterbacks. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I, maybe that's what he was saying, but um, he put a lot of work. My numbers were great. My senior year, over tw 28 touchdown passes, um, over uh, 2,000 yards passing, and um, it was just you know that I looked more like a quarterback than I ever did my senior year, and he wanted me to go to the CFL. Yeah, but I wanted to play right now. Did you ever do any in high school or college any kickoffs or punts never. or anything like that? I never. You, obviously, a punt. you were you know you were a dual threat quarterback right in high school and college, so you had that going for you. I'm just wondering like how a scout is just gonna be like, like obviously looking back now hindsight 2020 that was that that scout made the best decision telling you yeah. that for sure. But how could could he tell that? Like for for me, if I, I was a I was a kickoff or a punt returner, I'm wondering like what to look for, like how to how are you good at that job? Like what do so you look for? Quarterbacks usually have a knack for both sides of the football. Yeah, you know I got to survey the defense. I got to know what's going on. Quarterbacks tend to be at younger levels the better athletes on the field. It's usually you know not the best passer, not the best runner. They're leaders as well. But quarterbacks in general are your best, the best athletes on the field. Not so much at the professional level, but at the, I would say, high school, collegiate level, your quarterback is your superstar. He could play safety. He probably could play DB or linebacker, depending on how big he is. That quarterback is usually the mold that scouts look for 
um, at a lower tier colleges to, to switch positions, to change positions, because yeah. everybody in high school was, was telling me, oh, you'll be a heck of a safety. You'll be a hell of a safety, man. You, you're, you're not for the football. And that was my coverage skills on, you know, special teams. But at the professional level, that's what the Browns had the year prior. They had an ex-quarterback. I think his name was uh, Austin or something like that. I forgot his name, but he was a ex-quarterback. So there was a mold that the Browns used, the scouting department used, in picking their return game yeah. guys. Today, like, when, when scouts were talking to you and things like that, do you think it, it helped that you were – a very ta- like a very good baseball player, a very good swimmer, very versatile. Like we could basically, this guy's like a Swiss Army knife. Like we could put him anywhere. I see that Swiss Army knife came out in the NFL. You okay. know that thought process, like man, we could put cribs anywhere. Anyway. But um, coming out, that wasn't the case for me. I thought you know I had a legitimate shot to play quarterback. But they were like, yeah, we receiver. But they, we want you to play returner. So I had to learn how to play these games. I wasn't a receiver. I was a quarterback. So I had to learn how to line up. I'm looking around at guys and see how they put that position in their legs. I remember watching Peter Warwick at uh, Florida State in high school and everybody, you know, how he put his hands up and just trying to mimic what I see from other guys. So for the my my rookie season, that's yeah. what I was doing, doing a lot of watching. Did um Antoine Randall, I think he was a quarterback in college and played wide receiver. Did you ever – was he – did he come out before you? Like, he, was he – did you ever talk to him about that? He was the prototype. Um, I yeah. did have a conversation. He, he came out a little before me, and so did um, Seneca Wallace. And these were guys who put up a lot of rushing yards that were comparable to me. You know, when you're coming out as a quarterback, you have comparables. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Guys who uh, you can say compare me to this guy. And it's like oh, that Mel all got the... five of it already. Yeah, exactly. He's already got it. And these were the guys. And the NFL is a what have you done for – well, it's a copycat league. So – Whoever won the Super Bowl, they want that type of quarterback. You know, if it was Peyton Manning or uh, you know a pocket passer, they want that. They want the pocket passer because they proven to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. If it was Colin Kaepernick or somebody who could rush, or Michael Vick per se, now they're going for the running quarterback. Mm-hmm. So the league has trends that who's ever on top. Now everybody's looking for a Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. Guy who can sling it sideways, mobile but can read, very intelligent. So it's a copycat league. Who's ever on top and wins, that's who everybody emulates. For a while, it was uh, uh, um, Belichick and crew with Brady. So everybody tried to emulate a Belichick-type coaching tree. Well, that's why we had Eric Mangini for a time, a period of time, and then um, Brady, quarterback style. Okay, so let's go into the uh, let's go into your, your rookie season. Um, you make the 53-man roster. You're told you are a, uh, you're on the special teams. Did you ever um, – was it like nerve wracking for you? Because I would imagine you're probably on. I don't know what the contract situation is like. It's either probably a one or a two year deal. Right. So they they sign you for a three year contract, okay. and at minimum, you okay. know, rookie minimum. Okay. So did you feel? I mean, but obviously they could, you know, ask you at any point. At any. Did point. you feel the pressure of like I have to prove something right now? Or Hell was it? yeah. I mean, it was from day one. The process. It was like being on um, Survivor. Or one of those uh, Bachelorette shows when you get a flower. Well, let me compare this to you. I, so it's really kind of a bad comparison, but I was on Worst Cooks in America on Food Network for two seasons. Oh, wow. So I'm trying to prove I something that. I've never oh, done before. God. I'm trying to prove something I've never done before, and, like, I'm good at it. Except mm. you're, like, you're they wanted you because you were good. They wanted me because I'm bad. Anyways, my point with that is <laughs> it had to feel very difficult being like I've never done this thing before I think I could be good at it but how who do you compare yourself to like I I feel like there was no blueprint at that point right so that that became difficult because there was no blueprint usually you can follow crumbs and just follow a guy's path that did it similar but again I'm out there eyes wide open I'm looking at everybody else I'm trying to be something that I wasn't a wide receiver I drop I remember dropping a pass in um training camp and um, one of the media guys, I can hear him say, ah, this, cr-. and then um, I heard one of the guys, I was jogging back, and then I heard out the corner of my, my ear hole in my helmet, this Cribs guy ain't going to make it. I was like, oh, my God. So just think of me dropping the pass. I hear somebody say, ah, it seemed like they were rooting for me being at Kent State, and I disappointed them. And I'm like, I'm like wow. And then one of my own teammates at the time, he didn't make it. He was like, man, this Cribs guy ain't going to make it. And I, I just, for me, it was, I'm here for a reason. 
you know, um, they have their starting wide receivers. I'm like, why am I trying to be a receiver? I remember Romeo Cornell walked in a room and it was 30 free agents and he only had, he had six draft picks that year and it was only two spots, two spots, 30 guys in the room, two spots. And he said, if you can beat a double vice and run down the field and make a tackle on the NFL punt returner, you got a spot on this team. I was like, oh my God, hell yeah, I'm in. And then I looked around like, what's a double vice? Because <laughs> I didn't, again, I was a quarterback. I didn't know these special teams. The special teams terms yeah. and the, the football terminology of non-quarterback play. So I was just like, man, if I could just – so I concentrated on that. I stopped – I literally stopped paying attention in, wide, in, in offensive meetings. I knew I was not going to play offense. I would still get cussed out. Like, I remember I got out there as a wide receiver. I lined up properly. Yeah, yeah. And I'm in, 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 in a defense switch, which meant my, my, my route changed. And I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm like, what I got? And I'm like, and they keep calling the cadence. And I'm looking around. I was like, Dennis, Dennis. And he still called the I'm like, what I got? What I got? And nobody said nothing. I was like, oh, shit. So I just ran as fast as I could straight and hoping nobody said something. <laughs> and I remember office coordinator threw his paperwork down. Like, I was like, shit, that's on me. And he started cussing me out, man. What the? Oh, my God. So it was just the rigors of trying to make it in a situation that I felt was like a shot in the dark. Yeah. All these guys. So I called my uh, special teams coordinator at the time, Jerry Rosberg, for no reason, just to have my name in his mouth, just to have my name in his thought process. So I was like, yeah, I called him. He was like, uh, what can I do you for, Miss Cribs? Like that, real like structure. And I didn't have a real question. I thought that I, I would have one by time he picked up the phone, but he picked up on the first ring, and I was oh, so, I was like, uh, uh, and then I just came, I was like, Coach, man, I just called you just so you could be thinking about my name, man, and he just started laughing, and from there, it kind of worked. He gave me a lot of work as far as special teams, put me in the front of the lines. He was like, look, this is what I could do for you. Appreciate the call, and then he told everybody, was like, you're trying to make the team, man, I guess any means necessary. Call me at night, I guess. Yeah. And, and and he started putting me in, showing little favoritism, and I started, like, having fun and just going out there and playing the best that I could, and I made it. Dude, that's awesome. That's such a great story. So, yeah, and I think, and I think you proved it right away. Uh, week 7, I believe, Detroit Lions. I think that was your first. I think it was, like, a 90-yard yes. kickoff return for a touchdown. Talk to me yes. about that. You're, do you remember that play, like, vividly? Like, a, like, I, like it just happened. Yeah. I had just came off an injury. It was my... The first play of the game um, of the season, I got injured. I had, in my mind, the best preseason that a rookie could have. I was making tackles inside the 20 and, you know, catching the ball, running it out to the 40. And I remember the guys whose spots I was taking was like, I made a tackle inside the 20, and he looked at me and was like, you tackle too? And I was like, you don't? Like, you're not going to be here because it's <laughs> like the more you can do. So I remember just, you know, I had a knee brace on and everything, and I just remember catching the ball and, you know, uh, running and it, running as fast as I could and seeing the kicker. And once you see the kicker, that's like, you know, I kind of lit up. I didn't have no moves at the time. I had to develop moves after that because people was like, hey, you just ran straight at him and then ran away from him. We would like you to step on it and then use an angle, you know, all these terms, yeah. football terms. But I just was like, like Forrest Gump, just running yeah. straight up. And then I just seen him, and I was like, oh, I'm going to run, go a different way. Yeah. Like, you're in my way. People would think I had moves. I, nah, I just, if I see you in my way, I'm going to go a different way. When I didn't want to get hit. When you see the kicker, is it like barbecue chicken? You're like, man, it's over. It's over. It's when over. you see the kicker, it's you're over. Like, you're like, and, uh, you see the light at the end of the tunnel, you're like, I'm, I'm going to make it. Kickers don't like to tackle, yeah. most of them. Yeah. So at that moment, I seen the kicker, I was like, <gasps> I'm a score. So I remember going, I was just me in the end zone, and I looked up and saw myself in the Jumbotron. And I was like, that's me. And I was thinking in my head, like, oh, and I hear the crowd erupt. Like, first, you know, when you when you get a kick return, like in the game, everything goes silent, you know, because you're so focused and dialed in on oh, yeah. the play. But as I was getting ready to score, the crowd, and then I'm I saw myself and I'm like, and then I saw somebody running behind me, which was R.W. McCorders. He was running behind me. And I'm like, oh, my God. And he about to catch me. So I started running faster. 
And in the jumbotron, I saw him dive. And I seen him, and then I was like, up, oh, and then I jumped. And then I only realized this by watching film that the jumbotron is a half second delay. <laughs> on so on tape, he dove, and then I jumped afterwards. It was like the weirdest thing. Like I'm running, he dives, hits the ground, oh, it's so and good. then I jump because I thought I was timing That's it awesome. up. And I scored. And I remember scoring and just holding the ball out and just turning around in a circle looking at all the, the lights flickering and the crowd cheering. And everybody was like, all my teammates were like, jump in the dog pound. I was like, what's that? <laughs> and, then, and then I seen people over there, they was like, over here, come jump here. So I ran over there yeah. and I hit the warning track and I slipped and hit the wall. <laughs> and then the ball came out and I was like, man, I'm gonna try this again. So I tried it, jumped in the dog pound, they pulled me up and the feeling was so great, you know what I'm saying, to score in an NFL stadium as a rookie and to have the fans all cheering for you and your teammates all giving you praise. It felt so good that I kept wanting it to happen over and over and over and that kind of is what sparked it for yeah, me. Yeah, I was gonna ask you if that like, and also if that was like a proof of concept that like, you know, in your head you're like, I can do this. Like I just did it, I, I think I can keep doing proof it. Proof of concept. Yeah. Once I did it, it was as if it became a new art form because well, like I studied the defense yeah. and all their responsibilities. And then I, I just wanted it to happen so much, so I was real analytical and strategic on how I, I'm like, I'm gonna get in. And I, I used to visualize myself doing it every game. I, every time I got a chance to sit down, before the game, I sit down and I would see myself doing it, close my eyes, and I would make it realistic. Sometimes I wouldn't score in my visions. I would get to the 30 and get tackled. And I would try to make it as realistic as possible. Like I juked here, I made a move, and I stepped on it, oh, I'm gone. And then I would work on new things. So some games I would get caught, like right when I, before I see the kicker, so I would work on how not to get caught. Okay, so I had to develop a stiff arm. So throughout the course of my career, I developed things that I would actually use while going through the hole. I was like, oh, so this happens when I do this, when I do, and become better and better and each time. That's how I became the greatest at returning kicks and break, broke the record twice and because I was, I, I just wanted to experience it over and over, that moment, that first moment. I, yeah, I feel like, I don't even know how, what other word I could say besides like addicting. Like I feel like that yes. moment, like I don't, I, you can't replicate that moment, I would imagine, in any other situation. Like you, it's, I feel like it's impossible to. The moment I scored at home at, at Brown Stadium, at home, it was, you know, you asked me, have I ever, did I, can I remember that? I'm like, do I? Like, that's why I want to play again. That's why I wish I still had cartilage in my, in my <laughs> bones. <laughs> yeah. Because all my cartilage and ligaments are still on that field. Oh, I believe it. I, I gave it all to the team. Like, I love getting tackled and hit. You know, I love playing in the NFL. Like, we would lose, but I would just, I love that I got the opportunity yeah. to play at the highest level. Yeah, when you retired, I think you, you put up an Instagram post that said, like, I, I proved, like, I would, I would die in that field. And you took some big hits. Absolutely. Ravens, and then yes. your boy James Harrison. Yes. And you, uh, let's talk about the James Harrison one. Uh, I'll get into a positive after that, but first no, let's uh, just introduce the Steelers. Yeah. Um, what do you remember from that, what what happened? Cause that was, that, I don't think that was a kickoff or a punt, I think that was you and the Wildcat. Wildcat, Yeah. right. I was, uh, actually I missed the throw. Um, in the Wildcat, it was an easy right route called Smash, and you know, this was, actually them having an offensive game plan that centered around me at, at quarterback, playing the Wildcat. And sorry, I, but so when did they when did they get you into the, the Wildcat? This was early in the year. So, I mean, in the week. Like, I was scheduled to play quarterback most of the game. We I think we had brought um, Gorkowski in at that time, but we were having our quarterbacks were injured. But, um, okay. or we weren't moving the ball. I forgot the circumstances, but I was catching the ball and rolling out to throw a regular pass route. They had me playing quarterback. I was just a quarterback. So we had a regular route. It was smash, which is a, a, a um, corner route and a hitch, high-low progression. Mm -hmm. If the uh, corner sinks too deep, throw the, uh, you know, throw the smash route, the hitch route. If the corner comes down on the hitch, throw the, uh, the, uh, the uh, corner right beh behind his head. And it was just that simple. It happened just like it, you know, they drew it up. <laughs> and it's the only time I'm saying, I never said this before. I, the, 
guy in the hitch route was wide open. For some reason, I didn't throw him the ball. I don't know why. When I look at him, I'm like, huh, what were you thinking? <laughs> Talking to myself. So I just was like, oh, okay. So I ran back inside. I'm like, what am I doing? James Harrison was right there to meet me. I didn't know it was him, but it it literally hurt. The hit hurt. And I was like, That's ah, a bad dude. Yeah. That's so a- it hurt. I'm down there. I'm like, dang. I'm like, and they like, you good? They like, stay down as long as you need. And I don't, it's not that I was, I didn't feel I was concussed. It just, the hit hurt. So, one, you know, that brought me, you know, because they changed the rules and everything. It was like, you know, they deemed that I had a concussion. And I remember uh, James Harrison also hitting uh, Muhammad Massacre that same game mm-hmm. and putting him out. Mm-hmm. So we both were in the showers. And I'm pissed off because I want to be out there playing. Right. And he's concussed badly. Like, he couldn't even remember what was going on. He was like, he was in the shower like, wait. Why are we in here? Oh, so I'm oh. mad, which is a sign of uh, con- having a concussion. Yeah. I'm angry, and he's just really forgetful. So I was like, man, we in the shower, man. The game <laughs> going on now, man. We, I was like, be quiet, man. And he's still confused in the yeah. shower. Like, wait, why are we in the shower? I'm like, we dirty, man. We just played and got knocked out. So I was upset oh. not being able to continue the game. Yeah. And he was concussed and forgetful. So you, and you came to uh you came to James Harrison's defense, I think, a little bit. I mean obviously you're good friends with him. Uh I forget what the quote was. It was uh let's see where it I is. I remember it. Um you're oh you oh he was like I think he was like so shocked by it and worried that he would get spent and things like that that he was like considering retiring. And you were like, you're a player, so play let ref ref, let the NFL administration let everyone do their jobs. If you get fined, just try to tailor yourself. But play the game, don't try and change who you are. And I, I think the quote has a nice conclusion. You go on to say, I think it meant a lot for him to hear me tell him, hey, man, go out there and play ball. And I told him as well, remember, we'll play y'all again. So don't think I forgot. We're boys off the field, but when we step on the field, I don't know you, dog. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's serious. The only problem with that, I was on a receiving end for a lot of the hits. Yeah, you're not it, initiating the hits. And it ain't like he gets the ball and I get to go hit him. Well, he's like the kicker or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so even as a cover guy, he don't, he don't have the ball. I lined up as, this is the crazy part, I lined up as um, a, a left slot and had to block him too. So I was like, they going to line him up over me? Lord Jesus. And I'm <laughs> I'm lining up like, God damn, I got to block you. And I'm like, I didn't shy away. I blocked. I cut him the first time. I used to change up my technique. I was ready for him. But is the problem is we punted so much. It was only yeah. but so much I could yeah. do. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, they were trying to eliminate me as a blocker. I mean, as a tackler. Yeah, yeah. But um, after the hit um, in Hinesfield that, you know, put me out the game, you know, I seen him in the tunnel, and his mother got him back. His mother came up to him and smacked him in the head hard, too. Like, and it was embarrassing a little bit. She was like, he was like, man, and he was kind of up, he was kind of pissed off, like, man. And she was yelling at him, like, that's your teammate. And he was, she, he was basically like, that's not my teammate anymore. (laughs) But he was, she was basically like, gave me a hug and was like, I'm sorry he hit you. And I had to tell her, like, that's his job. That's football. That's football. Damn. Like, is it not the linebacker's job to hit the guy with the ball as hard as he can? Yeah. That's what I would do. So I, yeah, I mean, you did. You were every. I, I think it was so funny when I, you know, growing up like I'm 10, 11, 12 when I'm, I'm first. Yeah, like 11, 12 when I'm first starting to watch you. And I'm, I mean, I, everyone remembers. Don't the make puns. me seem that old. No, I, well, I, I just, I, you know, you're not that old. 10, 11, 12. I'm, oh, I just turned 30, so I'm not I that much. I just turned 30. I'm 30. You're 33. Three. Yeah, like yeah. That. Let's yeah, just you can get some that. calls soon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I always remember it's so funny watching you. Everyone remembers the kickoffs and the punt returns for touchdowns. It would be so funny when you would make like a tackle on, like, on special teams, and I'm like, what the hell is Josh Cribbs doing out there tackling? You, you don't understand special teams means everything. Right. It's not just, which is so funny. But it was so cool to see, like, obviously the Browns had their struggles against the Steelers when you were there, against everybody, but against the Steelers especially. You did not. Right. You played your best games against the Steelers. Absolutely. What, what was that? I think it was more so our fan base, you know, um, how we were treated when we did good against the Steelers or even won the few times. Our fan base treated us like royalty. Um, I think in a Thursday night game here in Cleveland, we beat the Steelers and uh, it was like the coldest game. We was running the Wildcat. They just could not stop it. Our record that year was six, was six and ten, but we beat them and, and thwarted their efforts to get to the playoffs. 
man, we was at the on the floor, floor seats of the cabs <laughs> <Yeah>. for free. <laughs> Put us up on a jumbotron. I'm like, oh, look at us. They was like cribs. They was cheering for me. I'm like, oh man, I need to do this more. Oh. Yeah. The fans love when we when we would beat the Steelers. They love when I would play good against them. That was the team. If anything, just do good against them. So my efforts uninherently rose against the Steelers. Most of my touchdowns came off the Steelers. Yep. Most of the stats came off the Steelers. I just would rise a level or two. And I not that I didn't want to rise any other game, but it meant more. And the fans appreciated, and I did as well. Coolest play ever. I think it was, I forget which year, it was 2007, I think. They call it, what, the Immaculate Deception? Immaculate Deception. Okay, so the ball, I, I want you to just talk me through that play because obviously it's a 100-yard. Right. It's easy to just be like, he went 100 yards for it. That's not everything that happened. Can right. you talk me through that play? Well, knowing that they were going to kick the ball away from me or, you know, kick a squib kick is what they call it. Yeah, they didn't learn too well, I feel it, like, against you. It just was the fact that, you know, they didn't want to kick the ball off perfectly to me. I got that. So I was ready for a skip, squib yeah. kick, at least I thought. So I was ready to catch a, a ball off a bounce. They kicked it. I mistimed it, of course. And the ball tipped off my fingertips. I'm like, oh, I touched it. I got to go get it. And I wanted it to go in the end zone. It would have been a touchback. But it kind of died right at the end zone. I'm like, shoot. So without thinking, you know, with thinking, I just had to pick it up and go. But do you, do you, I mean, you've watched that play, I'm sure. Do you see how calm you are? In yes. Your, it's like, you're like, oh, I got to. Exactly. I got to call a little bit. All right, now I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll go. Exactly. They're, they're like literally at like the, like you're making moves at the one yard line. We were well coached. Let me tell you this. So I had already made a mistake of having the ball t uh, tip off my fingers. So coach, the coach, Jerry Rosberg at the time, you know, he basically was like, don't make compound mistakes. Mm. You know, I don't, we don't like quicksand. You're going to make mistakes as football, but don't make a mistake and then another one, then another one. So after the first mistake, I was like, ah, messed up. I don't want to make it worse. Let me go and do my job. So I went back really just to retrieve the ball. And it w didn't go in the end zone. So I was calm like, I'm going to get cussed out. Ain't nothing I can do about it. I'm going to just take it and roll with the punches. He's not get cussed out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you could uh, find footage of the actual booth, of the defensive coaches in the booth, as soon as I picked up the ball to take a step, everybody start cussing. Like, oh, shit cussing because they thought I was going to get tackled yeah. inside, the, you know, yeah. and we were going to end up punting and giving good field position to them. Yeah. And what transpired, I had to watch on film for myself. Again, I was just making people miss because I didn't want to get hit. So it wasn't like I just was having these moves and just bringing them, you know, that I had it well thought out. I seen, like, the whole team coming this way. I'm like, oh, didn't want to get hit. And I seen a guy here, oh, don't want to get hit right here. Then yeah. the guy pushed me. I'm tight roping. I see out of bounds. I'm like, I don't want to step out just yet. And it transpired into a return that I can watch over and over and over. And it's it's a reason for that. So in any fumble or when the ball hits the ground unintentionally, it causes the defense to become out of fun, uh, lose their fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, their spacing. They Everybody's lose got it. like a lane kind of, right? Yes. Yeah. But in the fumble, it's different. Yeah. It's a free ball, see ball, get ball. Oh, yeah. So a person who is responsible for uh, uh, contain, he sees the ball. He's like, oh, let's go get the ball. He loses the contain. S same thing on this side. Same. It's a frenzy, a free-for-all. That's what happens when it's a fumble on the ground. Everybody lose contain. Everybody just see the ball, go get ball. Yeah. But if a person had it, now everybody in their regular containment. So because the ball was on the ground, it was a free fall. The Steelers were completely out of three. I made one move and three guys slipped past me. I made another one and another two guys slipped past me. I'm like, man, what is your – when I watched the footage, I was like, you guys lost contain, containment like eight times on this play. Like, <laughs> what is the problem here? That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, one of my uh, coaches who uh, – the coach who coached against me, Special teams quarter, co uh, coordinator at the time for the Steelers. Yeah. His name was Amos Jones. He was the coach that had me coach for him when I coached for the Browns. He was like, "Man, you terrorized me." Oh, so he probably long. you give him nightmares at night. I'm sure. He said, "So now you on my team. Now I'm bringing you with us." But oh, that's that, awesome. That return was just so memorable. I I didn't recall even doing it when it happened. When I scored, I was like. 
Yeah, I meant to do that. I'm back at the end zone, you're like, yeah, I'm like, zone, you're like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I meant to do that. No, but I had to watch it on tape to actually see what I'd actually done. And it was just, like you said, immaculate. Well, I, I mean, it's, and I know it's off of the immaculate reception and everything like that, but that's the greatest return. And I mean, I, I'm not I just, believe so. That's not that's not news to you, but that is the greatest return. And and me watching it as a, as a kid live with my dad, watch every game together, couldn't believe it. That was amazing. Couldn't yes. believe it. I yes. I couldn't even. The greatest, the greatest ever. You have it. You have it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Not Devin I Hester. Couldn't believe it. Yes. Not Devin Hester. Yeah. Not Corral Patterson. You. That's pretty cool. It is. And you always so and that before in that game you had a 90 yard uh, return that I forget it was punter kickoff, but it was almost a touchdown. Between that, oh, right? But I know, I know. That's the worst. You were still pumped. You were still pumped. Yeah, but at least you're on like, a five yard. You're like, damn, I wanted that touchdown. Yeah, I did. I, you did walk into the end zone. Yeah. You're like, I should have been here. So between that game and then that one Kansas City Chiefs game where you had two two actual touchdowns, which game? Which game is better? Oh man, that's difficult. I would only say the um, Kansas City game is because we won. Oh, I like that answer. And I broke the record twice for most kickoff with touchdowns in NFL history. Yeah. And I think that became most memorable, breaking my rec- breaking the record and then breaking my own record in the same game. I think, you know, bar none, that's what set me apart in the return game, you know, because you can hear the announcer say, like, hey, Cribs is on another level. And I just can hear it over and over and over, like, man, it really paid off from when I first scored against the Lions. Yeah. To those last two touchdowns. I, th- I think people. I, I was talking to his friends yesterday. A couple of friends saying I was, I was interviewing you. They were pumped. One of my friends from Chicago. And I don't know if you know the. I mean the jersey sales or anything like that. I don't necessarily know that number, but people love like especially now with the rules and things like that. You know it, those plays don't happen. Going to happen again. No, yeah. but your impact. I feel like it wasn't just on Cleveland. Like there, I know people. I was talking to you yesterday. My friend in Chicago. He's like, oh, I have so much fun. Like I have his jersey in my locker. He, really? This dude's a diehard Bears fan. But wow. he loved your game. Wow. And there, I, and there's probably so many people like that, probably, mm-hmm. you know, out there that I talk to. And I have a buddy in L.A., same thing, nothing to do with the it's Browns. You're right. You're right. And it was just football fans. And it's like, it's the same thing as a kid for me. I was rooting for Michael Jordan. I grew up in Washington, D.C. We had a basketball team, but I'm rooting for the um, Bulls because of Michael Jordan, because of certain select players in your childhood or – in the sport that you love will succeed and you like that guy. And that happens across the world. Yeah. So you finished, I believe, with was eight kickoffs and three punt return touchdowns. Um, had a, I mean, unbelievable career with the Browns. I feel like there was a, there was a moment in 2010, I believe, like you're, you're named to the all-decade team, right? You're named to the all-decade team in January. And then you're talking with the Browns. I don't know how long those talks are, but I feel like they completely – disrespected, low-balled you with, like, a really low offer. And I remember you having quotes being like, I don't know if I'm, I don't, I'm going to clean up my locker. I don't know if I'm ever going to come back. Right. And then I think a couple months later they give you a three-year contract extension or something like that. What what changed? What? Well, I remember that um, I had a discussion with Jim Brown. And um, Eric Mangini was the coach at the time. It was a lot of... It was a different um, front office, so that was a it was a lot of things going on in the front office, where uh, Mike Holmgren had just got there, and um, basically I'd outplayed my contract. You know, I was doing Wildcat, I was doing I was on offense a lot, um, you know, leading in every category in special teams, and yet, you know, I'm getting made fun of from all my friends, all my you know colleagues, my teammates. They're like, man, Cribs has signed a uh, twenty-year, two million dollar contract, and he, you know, he's still playing that same contract. Dawson were the offense in the two thousands, and that's crazy. Let me tell you this: the reason why I got so mad, I didn't score that Pittsburgh game, because I would run, I would run uh, returns all the way back to the fifteen, the twenty, and we'd be kicking a field goal from the twenty-five. We we would have lost yards as an offense. A lot of times when I didn't score, we didn't score. It's the reason why I was well known in Phil Dawson because we kicked a lot of field goals. We didn't score. We didn't get in a lot. We just weren't successful on offense. And, you know, the contract negotiation I was so new to, 
I remember one of the, you know, early in the year, one of the guys who weren't, who they end up getting rid of came to me and said, you weren't worth the two million we gave you, at for, you know, the first year. And I was just like, and that opened my eyes to the business of the NFL. I had a conversation with Jim Brown. He said, hey man, my day, we had to just play. We was good enough, they gave us the money. I suggest you just go play. Show them what you made of. They, they, it'll come. They don't have no choice. They'll look at you balling out. They give you that, that contract, son. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna listen to them. I went out there and played, had a dynamic, a dynamic uh, uh, preseason. Mm -hmm. And I remember Jim Donovan, I remember watching the game and Jim Donovan was like, you know what I would do? Renegotiate his contract. And that's when um, Deion Sanders coined the term pay the man. And they started calling me pay the man. Cause at, by that time they knew, I, you know, I wasn't happy Damn. with the contract. And uh, they was just like, pay the man. So they would call me pay the man all the time. That's until awesome. Until I got a contract, then they would call me paid man. I never thought about that because you, I mean, especially back then, I feel like quarterback contracts were at least maybe, maybe more years. I don't know, maybe they're more now, but obviously quarterbacks, you know, they get the biggest deals and things like that. You are the offense for the Cleveland Browns for the most consistent offense to set them up for field goals, mostly field goals, but touchdowns and things like that. And I just, I always felt like you were never, like it was one thing to be like, this is our offense, but you were ne it was never like right. reciprocated that way. It was never. But the way you went about your business and still like that's a, it was my love for the, the the city. Yeah, love for the team. Like I had no intentions of really wanting to leave. I'm just like, hey man, throw me a bone. Like I'm a dog out here, man. Throw me a bone. Like, come meet me halfway. Meet me in the middle. Let's let's come to yeah. the table. And those are the things that didn't happen at the time. So yeah. that can be a problem when a guy wants to stay and then they're trying to play hardball with you. So you're with this organization. If I believe was it eight seasons? Eight years. Yeah. Eight. Was it difficult? When they were like, we're, I think it was 2013, when they're like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bring you back. You had to go. It definitely was. Yeah. Um, it definitely was. Um, I think uh, Chud Chazinski was the uh, head coach at the time. Yeah. And um, he just was like, yeah, they, uh, you know, they're not gonna renew your contract. Like they not, we're not gonna do contract talks and stuff like that, man. So good luck. And I just was like, cool, all right. So. I knew it was over here in Cleveland, so I wanted to still play. Um, it was funny, um, first team to offer me was the Steelers. And um, I just was quiet about it because a lot of people were like, you should have took it, you know, and especially in my circle. And I, But I just could not see myself coming back into Brown Stadium. Joe Hayden did a really good job because he, he was did. there a couple weeks ago. He finessed it. I say he, would, he's, he finessed that he, situation. Somehow. Yeah, because you, to me, I, you couldn't do that. Right, that's the least I thought. Wow, like you couldn't do that yeah. after being, you know, I was just too diehard to the fan base. Not that he wasn't, because when he was with this team, he was everything to the fans mm -hmm. and he was everything on the field. But he finessed it really well, because I mean, that's the business of the NFL, and I think our fans have evolved as well to understand, hey, is this the business, is the nature of the NFL, and, and those things happen. Had I felt like that or had that inkling, I probably would have been a Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, and you talk about, I mean, people talk about, oh, like, this player's not loyal and things like that, but yet when you, you know, wh whether it's player gets cut or you don't get resigned, it's like, where was the loyalty there? So that's where you could see it being. But that's how, that's that's crazy that you love that place so much that, I mean, it's, it was so cool just to see when you came in in 2005, quarterback Kent State coming in and all the things that happened, and then see you walk away was so sad, but it's really cool to see you back in the city. You could live anywhere in the world. Why here? Why back here? It's the fans. You you ever heard of uh, the Cheers song? Sometimes you wanna go yeah. where everybody I don't know the lyrics, but you got it. Name. But nah, it's, um, it, it definitely was a fan base, yeah. and this was my home. When I left Cleveland, I went to Oakland, and I got, homesick from being out there. I got homesick from Cleveland. Damn. So I spent my whole adult life here. And um, everything moved right. I had my family here. And this is where I wanted to be. It was okay. It's so, For me, it's okay to vacation. But this was the my, my heart. This is where my yeah. heart was. And everywhere else wasn't right for me. Mm -hmm. And it felt like I was just, I was, I was, ah, 
devastated to leave, and I was just very unhappy in Oakland. Um, and then I was able to go to the Jets. Um, it was good being back on the East Coast, closer to where I'm from in, in Washington, D.C., so a lot of my family came up to visit a lot. This still wasn't right. Ended up going to the Indianapolis Colts and having an opportunity to play in the AFC Championship, finally have a playoff game. Uh, we beat the um, Bengals in the playoffs in the first round, and then we played uh, – we beat the Denver Broncos and um, to get to the AFC Championship against the Patriots. And just to play in the playoffs and have the opportunity for me was like a uh, cherry on top for my career. You know, to play at, you know, on that stage, um, it was great. It was just a great feeling to play with a good organization that valued their players. I remember um, um, being in practice and the coach basically saying, all right, special teams period is done. You know, cribs hit the showers like that. I'm like, man, I can't my team's out here. He's like, hey, man, I brought you here to run kicks and punch back, make tackles. I ain't bring you here to play offense. We don't need a wildcat. We got Andrew Luck. If we're like, we're going to run a wildcat th this week, we'll let you know. But hit the showers. Yeah. Go to the hot tub, get some treatment or something. I'm like, it was love. And it was an experience that I wasn't used to, but uh, grew accustomed to while playing for the Colts. That's awesome. I'm glad it was a cherry on top. Um, before I get into like the other, like the end of like your retirement and career and things like that, I forgot to ask about when exactly did the Browns tell you that like you're going to start running Wildcat and things like that? When when exactly was that? Because that's that's interesting. From making the team, yes, and and being a return specialist to being like we're going to have packages for you to be. Because that's why a lot of people are like we wanted, we want to see you start a quarterback, especially with your background. Very interesting. Yeah, we were losing so much. I wanted to help out. We were losing so much. I, again, remember I told you, I wasn't paying attention too much in, in uh, offensive meetings. They didn't have me running routes and stuff like that. Yeah. I was drawing plays that we ran in Kent State at Kent. And we were losing so much that I gave those plays. It was about a package of 12 plays that I presented to the offense coordinator at the time. You're like a Thanos? You're like, I'll, I'll do it myself? <laughs> I'm like, listen, we're not winning. We're not having no success. I want to win. I was a quarterback. So... Also, being a quarterback comes with a, a certain leadership. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't, you, I didn't have to learn how to become a leader. I was a leader in college for four years. I, I, I'm, new to, I'm true to this. I wasn't new. So I went to his office. I'm like, Coach, man, I think these plays can really help. One in Wildcat. Um, we could change it up a bit to throw the defense off a little. They, they haven't seen nothing like it, especially for me. I think we can have success doing this. You know, I play quarterback, blah, blah, blah. That's, what it, that's when it all started. After a few weeks, that's cool. We were losing again, and he was like, "Let me see them plays." Yeah, and we put them in, and they called it the flash package. Oh, that's cool. That's what it was called. So everybody else called the Wildcat, but on our team, it was called the flash. The package. flash package. That's yeah. cool that it worked. Um, that it was able to work. Yeah, I feel like your leadership. I feel like it's uh, it's in your, it's got to be in your DNA, right? Like that Cribs DNA. Like, were your parents both Marines? Both Marines. And then your. I found I didn't know you had an uncle that played in the NFL. Yes, Joe Creel. Yeah, he had a good career. Yeah, yeah, for the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, he had yeah. a really, really good career. I feel like it's in that DNA. That's so funny. I could just imagine you like having like a PowerPoint presentation. You're like, why Josh Cribs should have Wildcat package? I don't know. And it's it, probably not. It was wild, on. But. It was on a a tat like loose leaf paper, <laughs> and I pulled Even it better. out and handed it to him. Better. And yeah, we got it done. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, what I so. As much as you love being here, as much as, like, what a privilege it is to be in the NFL and, like, yes. have that career and, and, and everything else, like, definitely, but um, you, you earned it, completely earned it. Was it, um, was it difficult? We talked to this with every quarterback that we, we interview. Um, just from having that, like, kind of like that, like, schedule, the camaraderie in the locker room, the fans, all that stuff, to now I'm retired, was that transition difficult, more difficult than you would think? I'm sure you had it in the back of your head for a bit. I say it was the worst. I was depressed for about two years. People thought I wasn't even in Cleveland no more because I, I wouldn't come out the house. Oh. I just stayed in my room, um, basically lived in my guest room, played video games, became a gamer, a low-key gamer. <laughs> like just, you know, drew the shades. You know, not having that camaraderie, that brotherhood, yeah. you know, after having it for so long and then it just being over in a in a moment, just over, mm -hmm. done. Not being the crib, not being, hearing that voice. You know, people calling me crib, hey crib, because in, in football you call people by their last names because that's what's on the back of their jersey. 
Um, it just, I would have dreams. I wouldn't call them nightmares, um, but it would be very vivid dreams that I would try to complete an action, like catching a football or make a move. As soon as I try to catch it or do something in my dream, I would wake up confused, like, oh, thinking oh, I course. still was doing it. Or I would wake up in the middle of the night thinking I'm late for a meeting. Wake up like, oh, I got, got this meeting. So it, would, it was trouble for me letting go of the, the, the process, getting up early in the morning, going to work, going to meetings. I kept thinking that I was still on a team, either playing or coaching. I just kept thinking, like, even when I coached for the Browns, it was even tough for me to do that because every third down, my legs would tense up as if I was going to run out there. Oh, man. For, for the, to return a punt. Yeah. So on third down. You probably needed, you probably could have done better than some of those guys. Yes. No slight, to, but also that's no slight to no them. No slight to that's them. That's just you. I, that was me. Yeah. That's what I did. Yeah. So on third down, I'm I'm measuring looking for the hell how the lines <laughs> is. I'm looking back. My I have slacks on, but I start tensing up. I'm like, oh, and I, man. It's like my body was pulling me towards the field, and it was tough for me then even to let go of the game. I would have to look down to to ground myself to say, oh, you don't have cleats on anymore. It was it was new to me. Yeah. It was a new experience. I had to literally stop coaching because just to help myself let the game go. Like, hey, you're not playing. Let it go for a little bit. So I, that, that process of losing the camaraderie, losing the game, in my mind, losing the fandom was very difficult. Yeah, and I'm sure that's the thing that the NFL thinks about. Every quarterback we've said, it, it, talked to has said – They've been depressed for years. It took them a long time. You went into, I mean, you've had a, a, a pretty cool media career, I would say, after that. And I, I think it's so cool that it's been local. Yes. I remember watching you pregame for things. So it's like, yes, Josh Cribbs is back. Like, we get Josh Cribbs. Um, did that help, like, replace it? Like, was, I, mean, I mean, also being like, I mean, you met your wife in college. You have, I, think, I believe, two kids, two correct? Two kids, yep. um, Any of that replace it? it? It did, you know, knowing that, I had a possible NFL career, or professional career, um, made me switch my majors early on at Kent. I came in at business management. As soon as I had one season, did really well, um, I had CFL guys, you know, getting my rights to play in uh, Canadian League. So I knew at that moment, at least it would have been that. Yeah. And I was an introvert. I have to learn how to speak. I just kid from D.C. Never see you being an yeah, introvert. Yeah, I was very much wife. an introvert. My wife tells it. She'll say, yeah, when I first met him, he never said nothing. Now I can't get him to shut up. <laughs> and, you know, that's what she said. But <laughs> I had to learn how to speak. So I switched my major to communication, mm -hmm. interpersonal communication and public speaking. And you went back and got your degree. I went you back. finished. You went back and finished. I went back and finished. Did you get it as to add your resume to get the Browns to pay you more? <laughs> No, I That's went back. Not, actually, yeah. You know, I went back because my mom, my mom had put pressure on my coaches to keep calling me, and um, even though I was making the money in in college, I mean in the NFL, they were like, "Hey, you got you told my son he was gonna get a degree. Hey, he's in the NFL. I don't care about that." Damn. He's supposed to have a degree. You Damn. Said so my college coaches was like, hey, Josh, I know you're good. You're making money. <laughs> you're having success. I love that touchdown last week. But, yeah, man, we got to finish up. And is, she, is she talking? Is she telling them? Because if she tells you, you're like, Mom, like I'm good, like whatever. She's telling them so that they yes, you, you exactly. would listen to them? Yeah, exactly. And uh, she would tell me as well. And it was just like, okay, mom, you know how kids do. Like, all right, all right, mom, right yeah, yeah. yeah, all right, mom, I got you. Mom, right. in the, I just scored two in touchdowns today, yeah, mom. I don't like, want to get my degree. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> what happened was, um, I had three incompletes at Kent because I was auditioning for teams. I had spent a week in um, in D.C. working out for the Redskins at the time, the Commanders, and went up to Buffalo, and um, they didn't count that as job interviews. So, you know, normally when you have job interviews, see, times didn't catch up yet. Sports is a job. And they didn't count that yet as job interviews. So those times, the few weeks that I went to train, the, I went to a bowl game, the Las Vegas bowl game, and I, I didn't get that time off. So I was missing school working out for teams. 
And it wasn't the grade, it was my, my three weeks of absence, bowl game and working out for two different teams. You just, he's just not coming to class. We don't know why. Yeah. We have no idea why he's like on like, TV. Like, and they said, no we can't why. accept that. We That's can't crazy. accept your, your visits to DC. We can't accept a visit to the Buffalo Bills or the bowl game that I spent a week out there for. So um, I came back, finished up my three credits uh, a few years later, graduated with honors. And um, later, uh, after the year, I used the uh, NFL continued education to get my MBA at uh, Baldwin Wallace. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. That's Thank really you. cool. Damn. I can't believe I didn't count that. That's so funny. No, that's so, okay. all right, we don't know why. You just keep, like, you need to show up to class. It's like treating you like <laughs> any other student. Yeah. Just, like, you're like, just like drinking beers and at their at the fraternity. You're like, I'm, yeah. I'm learning in the NFL. So, you're a fan now. You are a, Definitely you're a good I mean, I talked to you the other day. I, I appreciate yeah. you having me on your show. You uh, are an awesome fan. <laughs> Being a fan now... Do you ever like recall a moment or like when you were like maybe playing and then you hear the boo birds or whatever and you hear people maybe like, Josh, what are you doing sometimes? You ever hear that and now you're a fan of the team and you're like, I kind of get it now. Oh, yeah, definitely. I feel like you just get it. I got it as soon as I became a fan, like as soon as I transitioned over and started rooting for the team because there was a time I couldn't watch it. So there was a time oh. when I stopped playing, I couldn't watch it. Yeah. I would have autograph session signings at the stadium and then leave before the game started because I couldn't watch it. I couldn't. Oh. I, I felt like I was supposed to be there. It was yeah. as if I was injured and was supposed to be there, but I'm injured, so I can't play. That's what it felt like. Like, oh, I want to be out there, but I can't. Not that I'm injured, but I'm not on the team no more. I can't. And it, it just still hurt too much. So when I finally let the game go and became a real fan, I was like, man, I still say this to fans like, I understood why they called the cardiac kids now. I'm like, man, oh. my heart hurts. Like, and it will never change. The anxiety. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, for the most part, I watch your videos, and I'm like, I feel everything he's feeling. Like, he's like I want to yell, and that, that's why I don't like watching the game. I don't like going to watch parties because I'm too passionate. I have to. I 100 the same way. Yeah, it's just same I want to cuss out. I want to cuss people out. That's not there. I want to cuss people out that's on the TV, and I can't do that around Yeah, you can't people. go. Yeah, or if you're on TV, yeah, yeah you can't go like, gosh darn it. Like, <laughs> exactly. Can't shucks, I can't believe we didn't score. It's exactly. like, MF or devil, what the? Yes. I feel you. You know, I'm 100% I'm the same way. I, but I think it's so cool that, I mean, Phil Taylor, I, I've, I've met him before, and he never left. Even when he was on, when he was right. in Washington mm -hmm. and other teams, I was, he's like, I never sold my house. Right. He's like, and he's just, he's here. And he, yep. he. If raising some his son, raising his, having his family right here. That dude is the biggest Pokemon Go. Really? I, don't know if he I didn't know that. Yeah. All he does is play Pokemon Go. Really? I swear to God. <laughs> oh, wow, I got to get him. Yeah, yeah, he's oh, awesome. Wow. But there's something about being here. I don't know what it is. I mean, I feel like a lot of people embrace their cities. They go back, you know, they move there. But there is something about yeah. people like people. I'm sure you hear it. Yeah. Like, why here? Like Cleveland, uh, mistake on the lake, you know, whatever. You could be anywhere. It's the people. Yeah. It's the people. We don't we don't boast, and I say we because I'm a Clevelander now. We oh, don't we don't yeah. boast uh, infrastructure like yeah man come the tourists yeah come check out this building <laughs> or something like it's our people yeah like we have real people here mm -hmm. and you go to L A and it's a lot of people that's not from L A it's a lot of people that's faking like entitlement there's an uh, entitlement in L A that's why teams in the past didn't do well out there that's not there's not a football city. Um, Cleveland is a football city through and through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Cavs won. Most of the fans were Browns fans. That's also Cleveland fans and Cavaliers fans and whatever sport that plays from here. But it's the people that we boast. The yeah. realness, the attributes, the being on the lake, the metro parks. And again, I circle back to the people and the relationships. Um, from when I've been, it's just more home than I've ever been. It, it, it gets me excited to go to, like, Florida for vacation. All right, that's enough. I'm coming back. I always love coming back. Going to somewhere else. All right, coming back. You know, this is where I, you know, was I'm able to ground myself, able to, you know, smell the clean air, to raise my family, to experience all the seasons. I don't want it to be sunny all year round. That would be nice, but I just don't want that. My, my children love this. The snow, they love making making snow, you know, snow angels in the oh, yeah. snow, snowmans, and going sledding. Yes, it's a little too much winter, but it we find it fine. The 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 falls are beautiful. Yeah, like I'll be, I'm, I love walking through the metro. Park. It's 
the beautiful sight, but this is home and it's the people. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I uh, I just did a trip. I went to all I went to all fifty capitals. I saw that. In like a little bit. How and was is, that? It was good. This is your interview, so I just, the only. Oh reason, my bad. Just, I'm, I no, get it's just, it's just an you have an experience. It's just an anecdote it. for something I want to say about you, though. But um, it was really good. It was really really mm. good. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. My point with all it is, you know, I, I feel like I have a good like, and you've traveled everywhere, being in the NFL, and um, I'm sure other things. Um, a lot of great places, like you said. So I love going to Florida. I love going to wherever. But um, and I've been everywhere. I've seen the mountains. I've seen everywhere. And there's nothing like here. I couldn't wait to come back on, like, the second day that I went right. out after, like, 30 days. I was in Hawaii watching the Ohio State Notre Dame game at Ohio State Bar in Hawaii. And it felt like home. And I, was, and I left. And I was like, oh, I need to get back home. I had, like, 20 more days. And I couldn't wait to get back home. Um, so it was really cool. It was really cool to see you embrace it. I, I have a few more questions. Um, I want to talk about special teams. Do you think, and I feel like I know the answer, do you feel like special teams is incredibly overlooked, disrespected? There's th- sometimes, I mean, three phases of football, people say that. But then I hear a lot of people just say, like, they lost on defense or they won on offense, stuff like that. It's like, I feel like, especially after you and, and Phil left, I couldn't tell you how many games we lost because of special teams. Right. Yeah. Special teams definitely overlooked. Um, all we got to do is look at our past uh, just a year ago. You know, um, we don't think about it when we have a good one. And I, let's just say uh, Dustin Hopkins. Yeah, he missed a kick or two here and there. But look how many games came down to his leg. You said something, too, on the um, on your post. I think he needs you have inter- some I, really good post. I appreciate it. I think he needs an intervention because he, he missed a PT. Yes. So he's like, I want to make a game-winning kick from yes, 74 it's, it's like, yards. And you said it. <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. I'm like. I, as soon as he missed it, I'm like, yeah. this SOB is setting up a game winner again. I'm he, like. He's automatic from 50. But he's then automatic. we threw the pick. And that kind of messed it up. Because sure enough, we were going to march down to the 35 or so. And he was going to kick and win another game. I saw it. Yeah. But I was upset at him. I, know. I almost wanted to hold his hand out and be like, shame on you. But we won I the game. James Harrison's ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But (laughs) special teams is overlooked. It is because until you get burnt by a team that has a good special team, you don't know what you're missing. Whether it be the kicker, whether it be a good punt returner. You see teams right now having success on punt return, and it's the difference maker. Field position is the difference maker. And a lot of times, especially through injury, if we had a good special team, that would make up for the offense. They would get us in great field position. Mm-hmm. They would cover well, put the, back the back the offense up, their offense, get us good field position, back the offense up, knock down the field goal. The field position battle when our offense struggles, especially throughout the injury, you could rely on special teams and defense, and they'll, they'll win it for you. But now we're just relying on defense. Hopefully our offense now through the, the quarterback change can – make something happen, but because special teams is not taken seriously. And I, I believe a few years ago when we got Jakeem, Jakeem Grant, they tried to address the so return. Bad for him, I feel man. so bad for him. They tried to address our returning issues, but injury. It, th- Two years in a row. Injury. Do those guys, any of those guys call you? I have an opportunity to work out with them. So I worked out with, uh, I worked out, I helped out, um, 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 what's his name? We let him go to the um, Lions. Lions. DPJ. Um, DPJ. I yeah. worked with J- DPJ, and I worked with uh, um, these names escape me. Be- but uh, our running back, um, who's on practice squad, uh, who's returning punts early. Uh, in the was year. it Pierre Strong? No. John uh, Kelly? No. We j- we had him already. He was here last year. Did really good. Um, um, Cause those guys oh, just came. Oh, uh, Demetric Felton. Demetric Felton. Yeah. Um, that was a guy I wanted to see get a little more burn because he was he was solid and catching the punts. Yeah. He's just not getting the opportunity. Um, another guy who I was working with was uh, um, Austin uh, Austin um, Watkins, and mm-hmm. I was I was heralding him because how well I didn't work with him, but I was her- I'm heralding him because I want him to get activated to join these receivers because throughout injuries, I mean I think he can really help this team out, but. Um, I do. I did have opportunity to work with a bunch of guys, and Coach Stefanski was open to that in the off season. 
He just didn't want to overstep, you know, coaching uh, during the season. So the guys, if they needed help in season, mm -hmm. I would meet them at yeah. high school. Met Felton at a high school. We'd go over punt return, catching punts, and DPJ as well. That's cool. Do you feel like uh, you've taken some huge hits? I remember the Ravens game. I thought you were dead. I, I literally thought you were dead. I thought I was dead too. Yeah, I thought you were dead too. I woke up. And I, I think I think the hits that you took, and other hits that has certain other people took were reasons why they kind of changed the kickoff rules. But they basically, it's almost impossible to do what you guys did, not just from a talent perspective, but just based on the rules. Are you in favor of the rules because they protect? Or are you like, yeah, I love yeah they're great, but also it's it's football. Like, I want to see kickoff returns and punt returns and stuff. Losing to go back to how they went before yeah. uh, all the concussion stuff. Yeah. Um, we sign up for that. We Yeah, we didn't know. I didn't know about concussions when I got into the league to, to the extent that I know now. Um, I would have tailored my play a little better. I wouldn't have took as many hits and chances. I would have moved my head a little bit more, just a little bit more. However, I still would have played the same way. I still would have been reckless. I still, because I love the game of football, but the rules need to change back. Um, the correlation that they were making that tried to make the game safe really doesn't make the game safe. It seems like it's even more concussions I feel like it's now. even worse. Guys are going out with more concussions, and I think that it's not that it's worse that they, they just diagnose and take precaution more often. Remember, oh, yeah. we used to get hit so much. The guys used to just come and say, how many fingers I got up? And if you could say it, that was the, that was the bar. Right, you're good. I got two. Say I say you got the I can see Just two. Say four. Say four. And they be like, four. four. Okay, you good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you remember that commercial? When it, when a guy gets hit and the man, they was like, who am I? They was like, who are you? And they was like, I'm Batman. And the guy says, I'm Batman. It's an old <laughs> commercial. It was a concussion commercial. No, nah, it was a commercial. I think Snickers commercial. Oh. But it, it was oh. it, the guy say, who who are you? Can you remember who you are? And he looked and was like. I'm Batman, and and it was crazy, but that's the NFL. It was overlooked that commercial, yeah, but it's, it <laughs> no, was no. overlooked. Like they didn't. I remember, I used to during the Wildcat. I used to get so hard, I would be seeing double vision, triple. Yes. My head would still be ringing, and I remember being back there in the Wildcat and calling cadences that we did not practice, and I was only stalling so that my head could stop ringing and I could see two instead of three. Cause then I could catch the ball in the middle, so I was back there like, like rule twenty two, and the lineman like, like what? Like dude, you we don't have cadence. Cause with me it was always a silent count. I just lift my leg up and then we go. But when I start doing the cadence, they were like, man, what are you talking about? But they didn't realize my head was ringing, oh my and God. I was just waiting until the ringing had stopped yeah. so I could call the cadence. But that's how I don't think even with the rule change that is significant enough because it, the same thing happened to me when I played for the Colts. Um, mm. I would manipulate the, the training staff so I could get my head together. And if I did get hit hard, I wouldn't want to come out the game. I'm not saying guys are soft, but I never wanted to lead a game. So even when I remember I took a huge hit and they looked at me and was like, Crib, do you know who we playing right now? And for the life of me, I couldn't remember. I'm like, of course I do. And it's like, I feel like a kid in my, you know, they asking me a homework assignment. I'm like, yeah, I know. And then I remember myself saying, oh, a big hit. And then the whole training staff turned to look. And then I looked up to see who we were playing. And then I sat back down like it wasn't nothing. And they was like, they came back and was like, all right, now who are we playing? I was like, playing the Broncos. Because I just looked. I just saw them. And they were like, okay, you sure you're good? I was like, I am good, I promise. Look at me, I'm good. And God. they let me go back there and play. I, wouldn't, I knew the impact. I knew how to pass the impact test. Yeah. I knew what they would ask you for. They would ask, and this is league-wide. It's called the impact test, and they perform it on the field when they think a guy is concussed. Mm. They ask you a series of questions, Right and they ask you to remember numbers or words right off the bat. Bird, something like this. Bird, uh, table, very different things. Bird, table, and car. And then they start, and they'll be like, can you remember that? Say it back to me, bird, table, car. I'm like, okay. 
So then they'll have a whole conversation with you, ask you to do another test, can you feel your hands, do this, this, and that, go through a whole little metric. And then at the end, they'll say, do you remember those three words that I told you? Throughout the whole process, I'm just saying those three words in my head. I'm just, I'm ignoring them. They like, yeah, put your hands, I said do this. But I'm not paying attention because I'm remembering those three words because I know it's going to come up again. Yeah. And even though I would be hurting in my brain, I'm still, I'm like, dang, was it a bird? <laughs> or was it, was it a rat? <laughs> or, I'm, and I would say them, and all you had to do was get two out of the three. Yeah. And I would do just enough for them to say, all right, all right, here's your helmet. I don't know if it's a good thing that you finesse the concussion system. That sounds like a... At the time... sounds scary. Let me tell you this. I'm a veteran. For a lot of players, if you got concussed, you got hurt, you would end up getting a split contract. Yes. So in some contracts, especially if you're a veteran, an older veteran, mm -hmm. they have what they call a split contract. If yeah. you're not on the field, your contract gets cut in half. A lot of people don't sign that, but sometimes you have no choice, especially if you're trying to get on with the team. So it behooved me to be on the field. I didn't want my contract cut in half. I was making a veteran minimum, which was a little over a million at the time. So I'm like, I'm trying to get my whole, my whole, you know, I got to be on the field. So I took that and I did what I had to do to get on the field so my contract wouldn't wow. be cut in half. I didn't, you ever heard that term, you can't make the tub, you can't make the club in the tub. Yeah. And that's just, you can't make the team injured. That's you crazy that you, I, did you, were you on a split contract at the time? I was on a split contract. So, so if, if, if you didn't say bird or table, you're losing be, money. That I'm bird and table. Concussion. Right. So you know how Denzel Ward and all these other guys would, would get concussions? Yeah. If he was on a split contract, that would cut their pay in half. So. Wow. I didn't even know it was a thing. Exactly. So ah, it depends. Regardless of the contract, when I was with the Brown, like I didn't want to get off the team. Yeah. I didn't want to get off the field. I'm doing what I had to do to stay on the field. Yeah. All right. I got, I got one more question before the. This is a, it's a question before the questions. It's technically two questions. Real quick one though. How weird is it having played against Joe Flacco when he's on the Ravens and now he's the starting quarterback? It's so weird. How weird is that? It's weird. I um I did a video on, on my Instagram um, of. Because I'm like, how do we post a root for Joe? So I was like, let's go, Joe. Let's go. Then I thought, we got a Joe already. Joe Petonio. We got a Joe Thomas. We got had a Joe Hayden. I'm like, we, we have Joes. Or we had a Joe. <laughs> yeah. So we can't say that. Then I was like, let's go, Flacco. Let's go, Flacco. And I'm like, man, that sounds like a high school game. I'm like, so then I'm like, <laughs> so I'm trying these different, yeah. you know, methods of rooting for Joe. I'm like, it just don't sound right because... He was a Baltimore Raven. He was a Jet. I mean, he was running Super Bowl for another team. He was in our division. He played against us, beat us last week on a fluke, last year on a fluke. How do we do it? But he go out there and perform like that. I'm, hey, let's go, Flack. Okay, Flack, we'll figure it out. Let's go, QB. However we going to root for him, if he plays well in a Browns, in a Browns uniform, yeah. I root for him. When I was on your show last week. You asked me who, who between DTR and Flacco. I think I said DTR. Yeah. And now I'm pretty good at recency bias, though. I think I'm, I think I'm going with Flacco. And that's no problem because yeah, you're able to evolve. You didn't expect Flacco to go out there and be as calm. And I call it he's a super veteran. Yeah. Unlike Deshaun Watson, and people can't can't fathom, oh, why isn't he rusty like Deshaun was? Well, he's a super veteran. Deshaun is in his 20s. Flacco is as old as I am. He is a super veteran, so he's back there like, I know at what particular time I'll get hit. <clears throat> then he gets hit. He throws a good pass, gets hit. He stays in the pocket. He can't leave it anyway because he's not mobile. Yeah. So as long as that pocket is secure, Joe Flacco will have – a good time here. Look good. He throws a damn good spiral too. Um, all right, one more question for you. We ask this for everybody. How do you how do you want people to remember Josh Cribbs? Ooh, that's a good loaded question. Yeah. Not how like not I like want... you're going or anything, but you. like my <laughs> career would like it's my memorial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your eulogy. No, Josh no, Cribbs not that. Was an honorable man. Yeah. I, I want uh, people to remember me as, like you said, um, one of the greatest returners, but if not arguably the greatest special teams player who could do anything for this team, whether it be for offense, defense if need be, special teams, uh, and an even greater father or an even greater person. So I try hard to make 
the person that people know me as an athlete, the same person as my family knows me off the field. Because I treat the fans with so much love and respect, I'm conscious of how I treat my family and the people that I love at home. I think people really remember too, like how you treat them. The the first um, impression of somebody. People really, especially you, people that look look up to you, Browns fans, things like that. People really remember that. Even if just like, hey, how's it going? Right. Well, yeah. So like, that's really cool, man. It was it was an honor. It was, seriously was an honor interviewing you. Thank you so much for it's the a time. Pleasure, Appreciate man. It, man. Thank it's, you. It's, I think it was the scenery, man, that did it for me, man. I yeah. was like, what? Penthouse? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know um, that, that big orange pump yeah. back there? You know what it's called? No. It's a crib. Really? I swear to God. Are you serious? It's called a crib. The crib? The crib? I don't know if there's a but it's called, yeah, it's the crib. Yeah, it's a crib. It's a crib. Yeah. So now you're going to have me going out there, because I can see that crib from on the, the crib. Um, from the uh, studio. Yeah. I'm going to be like, yeah, so it's a, the crib. It's out a crib. Yeah. I swear to God. I'm going to bring water. that up. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's called the crib. The source, the offense, the if you source. will. There you go. There you go. You gonna have me coining that I time. I got you. <laughs> I got you, man. I'm gonna have I got you. Tell it.